Father, thank you for the reality that you are ready to receive each and every one of us, no matter where we've been or what we've done, with open arms. You give us grace and mercy because of Jesus, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the blessings in our past. Father, I thank you for the ministry that Sean had here at Calvary for uh, 10 years, and I thank you that you're giving him uh, a place of service and impact now, and pray your power upon him, because you're not just uh, the God who did great things in the past, you're the God of future and hope. And so, Father, today we open up our lives to you and ask for you to fill us with a future and a hope that you'd speak truth into our hearts and change us so that we might live powerfully as sons and daughters of God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, wow. Really sorry for those sitting in the cheap seats who have obstructed views and uh, all that kind of stuff. Unless, of course, you know, it is easier to sleep in those situations in places. So, uh, hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are still in our Are You Happy series looking at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, the passage where, where Jesus is talking about uh, how to be blessed, how to be happy. And, and by the way, if you didn't bring a Bible with you today or you don't have a Bible app on your device, uh, there's Bibles in the pews all around you. Uh, grab one of those, use it, and if you need it, take it. Um, so uh, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And, and blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, they will inherit the kingdom of God. Now those are the, the keys, the clues, the path to happiness that, that Jesus gives us. And we want to be happy, don't we? Yeah, we want to be happy. We want to be blessed. We want to have a, a joy-filled life. And one of the things that gets in the way of our joy is conflict. It's conflict, right? Because everybody just doesn't agree with us. Everybody doesn't live life the way that we think they should live life. And so there's conflict all around us. Uh, how many of you hate conflict? Yeah, lots of hands go up, but not everybody raised their hands. So there's some of you that actually wake up in the morning wanting to get in a fight with someone. <laughs> You're just like, ah, I just can't wait for somebody to say the wrong thing. I'm going to jump down their throat with both feet. I just love that. Um, see, the reality is we live in a sinful world for now. Jesus is going to fix that. But we live in a sinful world, and, and so conflict is a reality. And, and yet Jesus tells us that we can be blessed if we embrace the concept of being peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And, and so uh, uh, if we want to live happy, blessed lives, and we've got to grab hold of this peacemaking concept. And, and I, and I want to confront you right away because most of us think that we would be happy if we win. See, we, we think, oh, if I win, if I win, you know, big in business, I'm going to be happy. If I win in this way, I'm going to be happy. If I win in the argument, I'm going to be happy. And yet Jesus says it's not about winning. It's about being the peacemaker that is going to lead to a blessed life. Peacemakers. So if we want to live happy, blessed lives, if we believe Jesus, then we got to understand that God initiated the peace process. This is where I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Some of these may sound real familiar if you've been around church in a while. If not, listen to all of it because it's really cool. This is Paul's kind of explanation of what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are the peacemakers, I think. Here we go. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. 
We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, this peacemaking stuff is God's idea. It really is the very heart of God. Uh, And so God initiated the peace process. Think about the process. It starts with this. We rebelled. We rebelled. See, God created paradise, and then he put us in charge. You know, our ancestors. Uh, But uh, he put them in charge, and and they decided to take over. They decided that they weren't going to follow the one rule that God gave them. The one thing they couldn't do, they did. They ate from the tree that God said, you can have all the rest, but just leave this one alone. And so they decided to do it their way. So understand, if you don't like the way the world is, if you don't like the way the world works, if you don't like the condition it's in, it's our fault. It's our fault. I know our ancestors started it, but every one of us has followed in their footsteps, haven't we? We've decided that we know better than God how to live our life and do it our way. And so we made our choices to thumb our nose at God And we rebelled, and our rebellion as people brought death into the world. And therefore, death touches all of us because all of us have rebelled. All of us have sinned. And all of us, because of our choices, deserve hell. We rebelled, and yet God reconciled. He he reconciled. Think about this. We started the fight. We started the war. And God started the peace. Did you catch what the the scripture said? Verse 18, all this is from God. All this is from God. And and, and in verse 19, he's not counting our trespasses, our sin, our rebellion against us. And in verse 21, Jesus became our sin so that we could live. Wow. See, God didn't just leave us In rebellion. He didn't just leave us in our desperation. He didn't just leave us destined for hell. God reconciled. And catch this not because you and I wanted it, not because we were begging God, please come and rescue us. We know that we've rebelled. In fact, Scripture says God demonstrates His love for us in this while we were sinners, Christ died for us. When we didn't care about God, when we didn't care about him, he still cared about us and sent Jesus into this world to rescue us from our sin. God reconciled because he loves us. God reconciled because he loves you. And he wants you to have life. So let me ask a question. The most important question I'll ask today. Have you been reconciled to God? Have you come to that place where you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? That you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, not just kind of some generic sin, but your actual sins, and that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord? Have you done that? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that heaven is your destination? Have you declared it to the world in baptism? We got to see that this morning. How awesome that is to say, hey, I'm an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ. He's changed my life and I belong to him. Now, here's the thing. If you aren't sure that you've been reconciled to God, then the sermon ends right here for you. Because you need to have a conversation with God. You need to talk to him. You need to let him know, hey, I I need this. I need you. I need you to forgive me. And and you and God have that conversation because... He's got something great to tell you, and that is that you can be forgiven simply by asking. Here's a really cool thing. As we're we're, uh, sitting here and I'm sharing this with you, what I know is that there was a man who came here this morning, and he walked in, and he said, I want to know Christ. And he committed his life to Christ before this service even started this morning, and he's here today with us. Isn't that awesome? See, he walked in here not being reconciled to God. He's going to leave here being reconciled with God, having eternal life, knowing that all of his sins are forgiven and heaven is his destination. We want you to know that too. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you know that you're reconciled to God, the sermon continues. There's some more stuff we need to know. We need to know that we are responsible to promote peace. This is our God-given responsibility. Look at verses 18 and 19 again in 2 Corinthians 5. It says, all this is from God. This whole life stuff is from God. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Wow. As followers of Jesus, we are responsible to promote peace. Peace between God and people. Peace between God and people. You see, God desires for people to know him and to love him and to understand that he loves them and gave his son for them. And he wants them to have life, not just in this world, but life eternal. See, that's the good news, that no matter who you are, where you've been or what you've done, your sins can be forgiven if you confess Jesus. That's awesome. And God has entrusted that to me and to you to share with the world because we've experienced it. By the way, that's why we do what we do here at Calvary. Because we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Everything we do is wrapped up in that. We want people to meet Jesus so that they can have peace with God. That's why we do five worship services. It is not because I like to hear myself talk. Okay, I do like to hear myself talk. You guys probably are aware of that by now, but that is not why we're doing five, so I don't like to hear myself talk that much. And, uh, and here's the thing. We do five worship services because God is entrusting us with people. And if God entrusts us with more people, we'll have more worship services. We don't know how we'll do it. We don't know when we'll do it. We don't know any of those kind of stuff, but here's just the commitment. As long as God keeps trusting us, we're, we're going to step up to the plate and do what he's asking us to do, relying on him for the strength. That, that's our commitment because that's why we do what we do. That's why we have these great ministries around here like Calvary Christian Academy like Celebrate Recovery, like Mothers of Preschoolers. And I so wanted just to use all the abbreviations and confuse everybody. That's why we have CCA, CR, and MOPS. <laughs> See, but that's why we partner with our community to, to sponsor things like the, the car show. It's in a couple of weeks. That's why we're partnering with Cooking for Cancer because uh, of the great story of, of Heidi Edwards. Uh, that, that's why we, we partner with Main Street and do teacher appreciation. We, we want people to know peace with God. That's why we give 20% of our budget away to missions uh, to tell people around the world about Christ. And that's why we send people and teams all over the world to, to lead men and women to that place where they can have peace with God. So let me ask you this. As a follower of Christ, how are you engaged in your responsibility to promote peace, to lead people to Jesus, to introduce them to the Son of God who will make peace with them. How are you fulfilling your purpose in that? Because God has entrusted this to us. Are you inviting people to church with you? And don't pull this, well, I'd invite them, but there's no place to sit and no place to park. <laughs> you know, we're trying to address that with the building, uh, which we're going to be starting in September. And, and, uh, and by the way, we have other services, you know. So it's like, well, uh, figure it out. Are you inviting people to come to, to, to meet Christ with you? Are you uh, in, engaged in, in helping other people in those supportive ways? I mean, because we're adding services. I mentioned that. So we, we need more greeters. We need more people working in the nursery. We need more people helping out with life groups. We need, there's all kinds of opportunities to serve, and, and therefore you. Are you doing something that you go, hey, I'm supporting this mission, this responsibility to lead people to Jesus? Because we need to promote peace between God and people, and we need to promote peace between people. And people. We need to live as peacemakers. We already talked about the fact that we inhabit a world of conflict because of sin. That's a reality. But Jesus wants to heal people and he wants to give them life. And so for them to get that message, we as followers of Christ need to know how to get along with people. If we're going to promote peace, if we're going to live as peacemakers, then we need to figure this out. And I was writing this sermon and I thought, I wonder how much of our effectiveness or ineffectiveness as Christians in our country stems from the fact that we are better at being warmongers than peacemakers. Think about this. In churches all over this country, people can't get along. Churches are fighting and dividing right and left. And occasionally they fight over substantive things, but most of the time they're fighting over you know, power, who's in charge and who gets to spend the money and, and they're fighting over preferences. I want it my way and I think we should do it this way. We don't, they don't fight over the mission, uh, you know, of leading people to Christ. They fight over how they're going to do the mission. 
And they divide, and the world sees that and doesn't see us as peacemakers. It doesn't stop there. It goes up to the denominational level. You know, denominations are, are, are fighting amongst themselves, and, and the very fact that we have all these denominations a lot of times resulted from Christians not being able to get along with each other. And sometimes, again, they divide over real issues like the fact that the Bible is the Word of God and we can trust it and Jesus is the only way to salvation. But a lot of times they fight over, well, the splitting hairs. And then they separate and they can't be nice to each other. They have to disparage each other and call them names and, and question their salvation. And the world looks at that and doesn't see peacemakers. And, and then, let's just be honest, we as Christians, we fight with our culture. Now understand, Jesus wants to change the culture of the world we live in. He wants to transform it, redeem it, one person at a time. But a lot of times, you know, we are just at war with our culture. And some of them are issues that we need to champion. You know, protecting the lives of the unborn. That, that's a real issue. Defining what marriage really is, that's a real issue. But a lot of times, we're just like taking pot shots at the world over their movies and the music and the pop culture. And we do crazy stuff like boycott Disney. And the world looks at us and doesn't see peacemakers. And yet, we need to promote peace. The path to happiness, the blessed life is through being peacemakers. So do you want to be happy? <laughs> don't you, you know what? I just confess. Sometimes I ask that question, and I know you, you don't know whether to answer it or not. <laughs> and some of you are looking around like, do we answer out loud or not? Because none of us wants to be the one who stands up and goes, yes! Oh, I'm, I'm it. <laughs> so thank you for answering the question. But do you want to be happy? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. This is awesome. And you've, most of you already believe in Jesus, so let's get really practical and talk about the practices of peacemaking. Because we want to be happy, and Jesus said, blessed, happy are the peacemakers. So I want to talk about three practices that just help you grow as a peacemaker. Uh, there are more than this. This is just uh, three, and I probably should have made it two because these are sermons all in of themselves. Uh, first of all, if you want to be a peacemaker, peacemakers evaluate actions, not motives. We have conflict because we judge each other. We judge each other's motives. We're not even talking about actions. And, and, and here's the thing. We are always wrong when we judge motives. Some of you are going, oh, no, I was right. I knew exactly why they were doing what they were doing. I was proved right. It doesn't matter if you were right or not. What matters is the fact that it's not your job. God is the one who sees the heart, and God is the one who's going to judge every man and woman for their motives, for their heart. And, and, and we can't see the heart. So if we step into that place where we judge motives, then what we're doing is we're saying, God, I want to do your job. Not a smart thing. Because you're never right when you want to do God's job. And in fact, that puts you in a place where God is opposed to you. And, and that's, again, we don't want to live there because that's not a happy place. So we don't want to judge motives. We can't see their hearts. We must evaluate actions. And if you want to use the word judge there, fine. Actions are, are what we're supposed to judge as followers of Christ, right? You'll know them by their fruit. You can judge actions because actions are real. You see them. You go, wow, that, that didn't look so good. Oh, that was great. And what's crazy is in churches, what I've seen is just the opposite. In churches, a lot of times, we'll excuse bad behavior and we'll condemn good behavior because we judge motives. Right? And some of you may have been like me because I grew up in churches all over this country where, where somebody will, will actually be rude and mean and, and ugly to people and leave a trail of broken, bleeding people behind them. And, and church leaders will make an excuse for them. Well, you know, he meant well. He's got a heart of gold, you know. He meant well. Really, he didn't do well. <laughs> Somebody needs to apologize. Well, we're not going to go confront him about that because he meant well. Uh, okay, I confess. I judged when I made this next statement. So here you go. Well, I decided that he meant well really translates to he tithes, and we don't want to make him mad. <laughs> but I have to repent from that because that's judging motives. So... See how easy it is for us to slip into that place where we just, you know, quick to condemn. And then I've seen in churches where people condemn good behavior. See, it doesn't make any sense to us. You know, somebody's serving extra hard and they're doing and they volunteer for everything. People go, oh, oh we know why he did that. Who's he trying to impress? I wonder what she's up to. Yeah. 
and we condemn good behavior. So if you, if you want to address this issue in your life, if you have a struggle with this, uh, let me uh, give you some, some things to do and, and, and write these down and, and practice them because we are only to evaluate actions. And when we evaluate actions, what we do is we ask questions instead of making accusations. We ask questions. We actually say things like, hey, why did you do that? Rather than, I know why you did that. Oh, imagine that. Ask a question. Uh, or... Uh, how about clarifying instead of assuming? Did you mean to say this? Because this is what I heard. Did, did, did you want to communicate this? Because this is what I heard. And, and I, I just want to make sure. Instead of, you know, what we do, I know what you meant. I know, it doesn't matter what you said, I know what you meant. I know you guys never have that conversation, but I think, I'm pretty sure it happens a lot between husbands and wives. And, uh, and we start judging one another's motives rather than evaluating the actions. And if you clarify and, and if you ask questions instead of making accusations, uh, what it'll do is it'll allow you to remove a lot of conflict from your life. Just a lot of it will go away. And by the way, uh, hold bad behavior accountable. Here, here at Calvary, we're going to hold bad behavior accountable. If you're hurting people, we're going to call you on that and just go, hey, that's not acceptable. We don't operate that way. That's not how Jesus operates. That's not the character of Christ. And we want you to change that behavior. And, and if that means you get mad and walk away, then okay. But we're not going to allow, we're not going to bless, we're not going to encourage bad behavior. And we're going to celebrate when, when you're doing stuff that God smiles on. So peacemakers evaluate actions, not motives. Secondly, peacemakers value relationships more than being right. How many of you are always right? Okay. Okay, there's a few hands that went up and confessed. How many of you are married to someone who's always right? Every service, lots more hands go up on that question. Yeah. I just started some conflict, didn't I? It's okay, I'm teaching you how to be peacemakers. It's all good. So peacemakers value relationships more than being right. And we spend tremendous energy fighting over who's right. In fact, a lot of times we're willing to break relationships simply over an argument over who's right. For the record, God is right. Okay, the, the scriptures use the term righteous to describe who God is as part of his nature, his character. And what it means literally is that God is always right. He cannot by his nature be wrong because he is righteous. We, on the other hand, scriptures describes as being unrighteous. Right. So just drop the chess, okay? <laughs> let's just go with that. It sounds all fancy and everything, but just drop the chess and let's just go with it. Scripture says that we are unright. Another word for that might be Wrong. <laughs> I know that's difficult for some of you to ever say. So tell you what, look at your neighbor right now and, 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 and look them in the eye and smile and say, God says you're wrong. <laughs> wow, you guys like that way too much. All right, there's more, so I don't want to lose complete control here. So what did God do? God's right and we're wrong. So God decided, hey, you guys rebelled and you're wrong, so I'm just going to let you go to hell. No, he didn't. He valued a relationship with us more than being right. And so he put our wrong upon Jesus so that he could declare us right. That's what verse 21 says. Look at this again. This is an amazing verse. For our sake... You and me, for our benefit, God made Jesus to be sin, even when he knew no sin. He was perfect. So that in Jesus, we might become the rightness of God. That's incredible. That's how much God values relationship with you and with me. And if the relationship for us is the priority over being right, then it will change the way that you relate with every single person in your life. Let me say that again. If you really get to this point where you can value relationship more than being right, it will change the dynamic with every relationship you have, beginning at home and spreading out from there. As a church here at Calvary, here's how we see this. 
We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Those are in order for a reason. Because we believe that love needs to come first before truth can challenge a life. And and that's why we do what we do. Because we want to love people, we want to build relationships so that they will ask us why. Why do you do what you do? Why are you caring about people that you don't know? Why are you serving the way that you do? Help me understand it because there's something going on that I don't get. And then we get to share with them how Jesus loves them and wants to save them simply because they're there. We get to share the truth about a loving God and a a God that can change lives and forgive sins. And and that's the way that we do it. We love people so that we can share life-changing truth. Here, let me sum it up for you in one sentence. Relationship precedes rebuke. Relationship precedes rebuke. And if you'll think about it in your own life, that's true. None of you, none of us, like to be rebuked by people we don't know. We don't like to be rebuked by people we do know, but we really don't put up with it from people we don't know, right? Because if someone's yelling at people on the sidewalk with a megaphone, you walk by, what do you mutter under under your breath? Idiot, yeah. (laughs) Guy's nuts. Yeah, you might agree with everything he's saying, but you don't like the way he's presenting it, right? We, we, if someone comes to your door, knocks on your door, and wants to politely tell you that you're wrong and they're right and you should live life their way, do you guys do what I do and politely shut the door? <laughs> See? Yeah, you because know, we don't want somebody to rebuke us without relationship. Even when they're right, we don't like it. Think about this. When was the last time that you got pulled over by law enforcement for breaking the law? And you don't like it. And we pay them to rebuke us. When we are wrong, it's their job, and they're doing their job. Next time you get pulled over, freak them out. They come up to the window and say, thank you, officer, for doing your job. I am so appreciative of the fact that you are vigilant today. They will ask you to step out of the car because they'll believe you've been drinking. All right? Just saying. And every officer in here is going, I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. You know, hey, guys, don't just, like, pull more people over this week to see if they'll do that. Just... But see, relationship comes before rebuke. So in your life, stop arguing over who is right. In reality, you're both wrong. So try this. Next time that you win an argument or you, you, you discover that, that you, know, you got the upper hand in this and you think that you won, try, try this. Hey, I found out that you were wrong and I was less wrong. <laughs> it's impossible to gloat that way. Any any boo-boo, I was less wrong than you. Yeah, it doesn't work. Because it puts us in that that proper understanding that relationship is more important than being right. And if we do that, this practice will reduce conflict in your life and help you bring people together. Finally, peacemakers own the identity of an ambassador for Christ. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. We're ambassadors. We're representatives for Jesus to the world. Let me let that sink in for a second. God has chosen you to be a representative for him to the world, making his appeal through you. Here's something that I have learned in years of studying scripture and especially loving the Gospels, the story of Jesus, Jesus was not a jerk. I'm strong, I feel strongly about that. So if we're representing Jesus, we shouldn't be either. So do you drive like an ambassador for Jesus? <laughs> do, you, do you tip like an ambassador for Jesus? See, I came to that place years ago where I went, I'm not tipping for service, I'm tipping for Jesus. Does your family believe that you're an ambassador for Jesus? Because if your family doesn't see you trying to represent Jesus to the world, then whatever you do outside those walls doesn't really matter. You see, everywhere you go, you represent Jesus. Everything you do, you represent Jesus. Every word you speak, you represent Jesus to this world. And God is wanting to make his appeal through you. 
And if we live as ambassadors for Christ, we take that responsibility seriously and we live to represent Jesus. If we live as peacemakers, here's the cool thing. People will know that we belong to God. You won't have to try to convince them. You won't need to identify yourself with stickers and, and pens and things like that. People will know that you're living different and they will not think about you as being part of a church or religion. They will know that you belong to Jesus. And they will want to know him too. They will be drawn to that, and you get to connect them to God and live the blessed, joy-filled, happy life of being a peacemaker. But it starts when you actually believe Jesus when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Will you pray with me? Father, you know our pride that gets in the way, the fact that we love to be right And we want to win. So change our hearts, change our minds that we as individuals and as a church can live in this community and around the world as peacemakers for the Son of God so that people will know that we belong to you, that there is something different about our hearts and our lives and the way that we speak and act because you have changed us. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for desiring a relationship with us more than being right. And because of that, we get heaven, and we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our amazing God.